man, have the have the mighty fallen. Let's just put it that way. Carson Beck. This goes to show you, like, they immediately after the NFL draft, they put out the next year's mock draft. Carson Beck was all the rage and talk preseason for this college football season. You had, let's see, the, the Heisman odds at FanDuel. He was the favorite for the Heisman Trophy in 2024. And he was the odds-on favorite to be the number one overall pick in the 2025 NFL draft. It doesn't seem like that's going to happen. But keep this in mind. Up until last week, last weekend, he was still one of the odds-on favor. He was 7-1 to one for the number one overall pick right after the Florida win. Now, 24-1 to one are the odds for him to be the number one overall pick selected uh, in the NFL draft. Why? Because he's fallen off a cliff. The dude, the dude had six interceptions total in a total of 17 games at Georgia, Chad, until the last five games, last six games now. 12 picks in his last six games. He's pointing to the lack of a run game as to why the offense isn't kicking it into gear, and I can buy that. But I can also point to just his fall off without the, the, you know, the comfort level of Lad McConkey or the security blanket of Brock Bowers. I mean, I'm just point to that immediately and think w- without those two guys, he's very average. Very average meaning not a not a number one overall pick, maybe not even a first round pick right now, Chad. It's it's really bad. And now he goes into a week facing some heat and a must win game for Georgia. They need to win to keep their playoff hopes alive. We'll have the rankings out later tonight, but we'll find out uh, how far Georgia will fall after their most recent loss to Ole Miss. And yet again, Beck doesn't live up to the hype against Ole Miss. He has a pick, doesn't throw for a touchdown. And that's been kind of par for the course this year for him. He's gotten worse. I mean, there's no no way to put it. He was better last year. Yeah. You mentioned two of the reasons why. Ladd McConkey and Brock Bowers were a big part of that. But it doesn't change the fact that he's worse than he was a year ago as a junior, now as a senior. Now, we also say that knowing they're almost a 10-point favorite at home on Saturday, and if they win that game, they're likely headed to the college football playoff at 10-2. and two. The, the rest of the schedule looks favorable enough where they're going to punch a ticket to the playoff, and then anything can happen once they get there. And we know Kirby Smart has playoff experience and a national championship pedigree. So... All is not lost or anything like that for Georgia. But I will caution that this is an example where maybe sometimes it can go really bad when you come back. And he came back with a lot of NIL money, so I'm not going to sit here and pretend he's not making a ton of money right now. And a year ago, yes, the quarterback class looked a lot better with Caleb Williams and with Drake May and with Jaden Daniels. He was not going to be in that mix Uh, Even Bo Nix, he probably is behind Bo Nix, but is he a first-round pick, end of the first round? Maybe. Maybe he's a first-round draft pick at quarterback for someone later in the first round a year ago. And then you compare that to 17 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, and being the butt of a lot of jokes this year and being, you know, photographed, smiling on the bench when your team's getting blown out, which who knows what they're talking about in this moment. But – when this happens, th- these are the things that starts to c- come up. A year ago, he was just, boy, he looks great in this offense. You know, he looks like he's going to be a first-round uh, draft pick. All was well. But you come back and you play poorly, and suddenly everything's getting dissected, including, you know, what you put on uh, TikTok or Snapchat when you're talking to people. Because now we're seeing screenshots of that happening, where suddenly his Snapchat is being dissected. And what he's talking about with people. And he's saying, hey, uh, can, can you run, run over run me, me with over your car, car please. so I don't have to play football anymore? Um, <laughs> yeah, look, it's... He's, I mean, it, so he, he, he's these, secured... these are things that happens when you're not performing well. And now Carson Beck is facing all of them. And I don't want to say it's the wrong idea to come back to school for anyone. No. Because I love college football. love it when players come back. But I'm just saying, here's an example of... Maybe not the best call for Carson Beck to come back. Now, thank God he's not injured, you know, and that's, that's not right. going to affect yeah. his draft status. But 
Everything else has not been as good as the year before. Well, I mean, consider he had 24 touchdowns and six picks last season. Threw for nearly 4,000 yards. Mentioned the receivers. They certainly had a better run game. Right now, they're 15th in the SEC in rushing. That's crazy when we talk about the Georgia Bulldogs. He's also the fourth worst quarterback in the power four for turnovers. He has 13 turnovers, uh, counting a, a fumble that's been lost. Um, it, he leads the, uh, the category for interceptions as well. So, I mean, you just think about the play and then the fact that, let's say, he drives a Lambo, right? Yep. He let, he's, was or is dating a Cavender. He player. is. Okay. He has a private jet NIL deal. He also has Chipotle. And many other, I mean, you come back for that, too. I mean, I would. I don't know where he would rank in last year's quarterback crop, but it was a group that were six quarterbacks were drafted in the first 12 picks. I mean, you got a chance to wait a year and be the number one overall pick? Yeah. Right call then, but the play hasn't lived up to the, the expectation for Beck. And, and that's kind of where Georgia is. They're good enough to overcome some things. We saw them nearly come back in, that, uh, in the game where... Uh, they faced Alabama, but Chad, th this is uh, it's troubling because normally Georgia gets the most out of their quarterbacks in the big, big moments. We've seen it against Texas this year, and really, well, we saw it with Stetson Bennett time and again. Well, we but we also saw Stetson Bennett face the criticism going at, right after enduring the SEC championship game prior to the first national championship run, and there was. We were in Atlanta for that. Yeah, and then they won it. But, and he, he won back-to-back. -back. But people were calling for right. him, someone else to start. Right. And, and, I don't know that anybody's calling for anybody else to start with Carson Beck. Well, it's just play better. Well, but can, can, you, can you rebound with the pressure on you? That's what Bennett did. He, he took Georgia to that next level. He helped win games in the big crunch time moments of the playoff. Georgia can win. You're right. Like, don't overlook the Bulldogs, but... I mean, I don't see a quarterback right now uh, that is leading this offense out of some troubling areas on the stat sheet and on the field. Yeah, it's and we're going to talk about some college football playoff scenarios, and we're going to have a new playoff ranking tonight and all of that. But I, I do want to reiterate, again, they are a 10-point favorite or 9.5-point favorite at home, and if they win that game, every analyst I've read is saying they are a lock okay. for the college football playoff with their schedule – to, if they finish 10-2, and two. so that includes not blowing it against Georgia Tech at the end of the right. year, but they're going to be a lock as a sure. almost 10-point home favorite but on the, Saturday. they're not a 10-point home favorite because of him. Absolutely not. And that's it's the because point, the other that's gonna be the point I want to make is the fact that you come back to school to answer questions. You come back for another year because any question mark that an NFL GM might have about you, well, I'm going to go show it again and be better. And then you're checking off boxes of question answered, question right. answered, question answered. What has Carson Beck provided for NFL GMs this year? A ton more questions. The turnover problem, fumbles, interceptions, the Snapchats, the laughing on the bench. You can laugh at this all you want, but there's going to be NFL GMs at a combine or in interviews that are going to dissect all of these things. His body language. Why are you laughing? Why are you saying this to a buddy even if it's a joke? They're going to nitpick all of these. He had far fewer questions to answer after last season than he does this year. That's not a good trend because typically you go back to school for another year when you have a chance to go pro to go ahead and answer any criticisms or questions that an NFL team might have about me. Oh, you think I can't do this? Boom. I proved you wrong. I can do it. Oh, you don't think I can win in this big moment on the road? Boom. I went and did that. Oh, you think I can't cut down on my turnovers? Boom. I did that. It's gone in the opposite direction for Carson Beck. And with all of that, Georgia's still in a pretty good spot to be, be in the playoff, but it's not the Georgia standard we've come to expect from a Kirby Smart team in a lot of ways. And it starts with the quarterback and his poor play. And I liked what he said when he came back. He said, hey, we've got unfinished business personally and as a team because they didn't, he didn't like the fact that they lost to Bama uh, in the SEC title game. Um, so you, you've got that. He, he mentioned building more chemistry and camaraderie. I see the opposite of that, though, with this Georgia team. Now, a chance to prove us wrong this weekend. But as Chad mentioned, Vegas still thinks, uh, while they don't believe that he's the odds-on favorite to 
Heisman, to win the Heisman, be a finalist, or to be the number one overall pick, they do have them winning against uh, the, the Tennessee Vols. So, and, and look, for Georgia, again, we're talking about expectation here of fan bases and programs. Oh, yeah. And under Kirby Smart, beating Tennessee will be nice for that program. They've beaten Tennessee, I think, eight straight times, seven straight times, something like that. They need to win in the playoff. Like, that's the standard for Georgia. Not just getting into the playoff at 10-2, and two, but winning playoff games and going on a run. That's what that fan base wants to see. That's what Carson Beck has to prove. It, but Hutton's right. It starts Saturday. You, you can't lose that game. It's a now, playoff game. There's a lot of people saying, well, at 9-3 and three with their schedule, they might get in over a two-loss team because of how difficult their schedule is. We'll handle all that after all these other upsets happen because we're going to see them across college football before we get to that final selection. But the standard is more at Georgia than just eking into the playoff. And even though they're a nine-and-a-half point favorite, they got to go out and prove it at home on Saturday because – the Vols have, and I didn't think I'd say this coming into the year, the Vols have a chance to deliver the death knell yeah. to the Georgia Knock Bulldogs out, yeah. on, on Saturday. No, and, no question. And start their campaign for possibly being a top-four seed and getting a bye and being the SEC champion if they win this game. They'll be right there with Texas to play for that SEC title. So, Chad, here we are in the NIL era, right? It, we all have seen this. It's been rolled out. We, we know where we are with the money for the players. He and I are, Chad and I are all for that. But in college football, and more so, we've seen it from the, the coaching aspect. You're paid to fail with these buyouts, astronomical buyouts for coaches who suck. They get fired, they take their money, and you know they go into broadcasting or they sit it out a while. They become an analyst and they're back in it whenever they miss football enough. The paid to fail mindset, though, is trickling down and has arrived at the player level. And the system is set up to coddle and caress players and coaches instead of hold them accountable, criticize them, or bench them. Case in point is a game that you may have missed because it was on CW with Rodin. I never Boston missed CW College game. and Syracuse. Normally, I'd point to both aspects that I'm going to bring up as bad things. Overemphasizing a loss in one case and taking your ball and going home in the other. One's awful. And in this case, Chad, from the coaching aspect, I'm actually impressed because at a close loss, yet again, Syracuse and Fran Brown well, he's not just saying, you know, we got to get better or pointing fingers or saying, you know, too many penalties, blah, blah, blah. No, he's, he's holding himself accountable. So much so that in a weird, odd way, he's saying he doesn't even deserve soap or, quite frankly, bathing after a loss. Honestly, I got like a ritual. Like when we lose, I ain't even getting a shower till early this morning. I just be mad. I just brush my teeth. But it's like, I don't deserve soap. I don't deserve to do all that. I just, I'm just focused on like trying to get back and trying to make sure that our players mentally understand and know that I let them down, that they didn't do it. You know, I just wake up all night, especially when you lose. You like wake up like, dang, it really happened. You know, it really happened that way. So it's just different pieces. Um, and then I just move on. There's a process that I follow every week. One lose or draw. Only thing is like um, my wife, I can't sleep in the bed <laughs> if we lose because I ain't going to get in the shower for that day. I'm just mad and I just sit there. I just brush my teeth. That's what I have to do. So y'all won't say my breath stink, but I'm just I'm just kind of locked in on certain things, certain ways. I think you got to you got to earn the right to do certain things. So, you know, winners get washed. You know what I'm saying? I'm a loser. I just kind of waited a little bit. I mean, winners get washed. Winners get bath privileges yeah, I mean, back. Normally, I'd say, hey, man, take a shower. Losers could also bathe and not, you know. Concerned about his breath smelling bad, but not about yeah, his body right. smelling bad. He's not concerned about I gotta you know, brush smelling my like teeth. someone I, from uh, London in the 1800s. I'm not an animal. I will brush my teeth, but I'm not going to shower oh, for a week. Yeah, the you shower pills are amazing. That, right? yeah, yeah. But it, encouraging because here's a head coach that's actually – not trying to deflect blame for whatever reason. Uh, and he's taking it way too seriously. But again, compared to what we're about to say, I, I like this head coaching stance. 
But here's where it's way off the rails. Chad, we've seen uh, Thomas Castellanos at Boston College perform very well this season, especially earlier in the year. I mean, he's a known name if you're watching college football on a daily or a weekly basis. Well, he gets benched this past week. And now he's stepped away from the team. And when you know it, he's stepping away from the team right before this open transfer portal portal is uh, about to uh, commence. This is ridiculous. I mean, zero accountability, facing criticism, not from the media or from fans, but from your coach. And you're willing to just say, hey, individually, I'm out. And this is, again, not some random player, not the quarterback from NC State last year who doesn't want to get hurt, so he's entering the portal. This is a guy who his play wasn't up to par. So O'Brien said, hey, take a seat. And he said, peace out. That's where we are, and it's sad, but it's also the reality. I hate that. But then again, we see that at every level now. Well, I, I can't come the, to grips with it. No, it, it's it's terrible. And Grayson and James, who came in for him, here are the stats on Saturday. And by the way, they won the game. They won the game 37-31. When Castellanos was removed from the game, he was two for seven for 14 yards, and he had five carries for minus 10 yards. He had a QBR of 0 0.9. When Grayson James came in to save the day, he was five for six, 51 yards, a touchdown, and a QBR of 99.7. A lot better. They're, yeah. doing, they're doing a lot more with their running backs, obviously, at Boston College than anyone else, but a lot better than Thomas Castellano. So instead of self-reflection or even just a, I'm pissed, I've done a lot for this school, and this is how I'm going to end my career, but I'm going to stick with it because I've been with these guys for so long. So I'm going to, you know, sit, stand on the bench and be a good little soldier and finish out the season. That would have been an okay stance. And everyone would have understand his, understood his anger in that. But Hutton, as you said, to take the ball and go home in that situation it is unacceptable. I don't care about what generation you're from. I don't care about what travel ball program you grew up in and what was acceptable or what your parents taught you, it's unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. I don't care what the transfer portal window time frame is, yeah, any of it. Exactly. You can transfer the moment the regular season ends. You can stick with the month of November where your season's going to be over. Two more games. You can exit out before, I don't even know if Boston College, yeah, they'll probably be in a bowl game. They're five and four right now. You can exit out of whatever shitty bowl game your team's going to play in and decide that, hey, I'm going to go on the transfer portal. I'm fine with that. That's what college football allows you to do now. But to leave your team during the season because you're bitching over getting rightfully benched, by the way, in a game where your team came back and won with a backup quarterback is utterly and totally pathetic. And, it, and he grabbed the soap, I bet. I bet he took a shower after. Yeah, unlike, he, he watched. unlike Fran Brown, he, yeah. he believed he, he deserved that shower. Yeah. Does Fran Brown also lash with, himself after the game? Yeah. How many lashes? Yeah. It's like uh, not only do I not sleep in my own bed. Yeah. I sleep in an isolation chamber for the next twenty four hours. Yeah. Much like Aaron Rodgers, he goes into solitary confinement. Yeah. He he wash he's washed in the blood uh, post game. We, he's, uh, he's not uh, he's not cleansed because so, self winners get washed. Self imposed solitary confinement for losers. That's yeah. That's the way they roll at, at Syracuse. For Castellanos. I'll tell you something that was acceptable. On, on Saturday, Tom Brenneman. Tom Brenneman oh. is now the play-by-play -play guy for the CW's college football games, which, as Hutton said, I don't miss a college football game on the CW. They always live up to the hype. Yeah. Tom Brenneman, if you're having a hard time locating the name Tom Brenneman, how do I know that name in broadcasting? <laughs> Tom Brenneman had some very unfortunate things to say um, about homosexual people in a certain city. In America, on a hot mic that he did not know was hot. Hey, welcome to Hot Mic with Hutton right. Withrow here. Did not know that the mic was hot and got caught saying it, either coming, going to break or coming back from break. And then the next inning when he was told, hey, everybody watching this Cincinnati Reds game happened to hear your rant and what you were talking about, Tom Brenneman delivered one of the more memorable on-air apologies ever. <laughs> and Nick Castellanos was present oh. in this call. Here we go. Over on the mound. Um, 
I made a comment earlier tonight that uh, I guess uh, went out over the year that I am deeply ashamed of. Um, if I have hurt anyone out there, I can't tell you how much I say from the bottom of my heart, I'm so very, very sorry. I pride myself and think of myself as a, a man of faith. As there's a drive in a deep left field by Castellanos, it will be a home run. And so that'll make it a 4 nothing ball game. I don't know if I'm going to be putting on this headset again. I don't know if it's going to be for the Reds. I don't know if it's going to be for my bosses at Fox. I want to apologize for the people who signed my paycheck for the Reds, for Fox Sports Ohio, for the people I work with, for anybody that I've offended here tonight. I can't begin to tell you how deeply sorry I am. That is not who I am uh, and never has been. And I'd like to think maybe I could have some people that, uh, that could back that up. I am very, very sorry, and I beg for your forgiveness. I mean, the best apology is since Sal Governale on the uh, Howard Stern Show. Here I am on hand and knee begging you, I would like public, to, think, to please, please forgive me for my sins, for, uh, for all of them, and nearly uh, getting choked up at says, the end of it. He said, I'd like to think what someone would believe me. The CW did. Well, also, uh, just in, uh, announcing his firing live on air. I don't know what mic I'm going to speak into next. It certainly won't be here at Fox. It won't be for the Cincinnati Reds. I mean, I mean it's classic. Just, like, put you know every type of sword up in the ground, blade up, and fall on it at once, and just impale yourself with eight different swords yeah. is what Tom Brenneman, which, by the way, uh, the whole thing over the top. Yes. Uh, and the yes. reaction over the top yeah. and everything, but – regardless, I mean, fell on eight swords at once in his live on-air apology. So there was the Nick Castellanos <laughs> moment that a lot of people refer to on social media with funny memes. And there's a drop. Everything else. Leading into this game, <laughs> everyone knew he had Boston College Syracuse. I saw during the week people posting about this is going to be the Tom Brennan Castellanos game. Again, oh. he's got who? Thomas. Wait for it. Castellanos, Castellanos in this game. Will Tom Brenneman make reference to that infamous moment? Well, Tom Brenneman, ladies and gentlemen, takes nothing lying down. Here was the open of the game on the CW. Good quarterbacks in this one. You know about Kyle McCord. We'll also see Thomas Castellanos. How about that? Oh, he's got Rizzi key to the game. Forgive me. Thomas Castellanos. Uh, as he overemphasized it multiple times during the open. And uh, his partner had some fun with it also. I love a good sense of humor. I especially love when people have a sense of humor about themselves. That is Tom Brenneman. He is an excellent broadcaster. Yes, he is. Always has been. He's doing a great job with those games in the CW. All kidding aside, I am thrilled to see him back working again. He's someone who should be working, and he's working now and doing a very good job with it. I commend you, Tom Brenneman, and most importantly, for having a sense of humor about yourself. Yeah, no Excellent doubt. stuff. Yes. Uh, here's to more games on the CW. Uh, here's, hey, and, I and want the beyond. CW, you know, they had uh, live golf for a while. Yeah, they did. I need the CW to get more involved in, in sports programming. ESPN has the sports programming tonight, Chad. They do indeed. And it's the college football playoff rankings at, it's in between games, in between a, uh, a basketball tournament. By the way, I had a funny moment talking about the CW. A buddy was getting, it, it was... Uh, we're, we have a, like a Vols group text of getting ready to watch the Tennessee games yeah. with friends I went to Tennessee with. And my buddy was pissed that Louisville, Virginia Tech was going to back right up to the kickoff of Tennessee. I think that was what was on ESPN before the Tennessee-Mississippi State game. And he was complaining that this game should be on the CW. <laughs> So then we got this, this whole thing about, yeah, this is definitely a game that Maybe should conclude Ion. with a rerun of One Tree Hill. <laughs> and then we started talking about Chad Michael Family Murray feud. and where is Chad Michael Murray. And that grew into he's in this <laughs> holiday film on Netflix called The Merry Gentleman that's going to be a big hit. And I'm like, oh, Chad Michael Murray is still working. That's incredible. <laughs> and we just got into this whole back and forth about One Tree Hill and Chad Michael Murray, who was such a, a hot guy back in the day, and still is uh, very much a hot guy, said, apparently. And oh. you can watch him on The Merry Gentleman on Netflix. Following Brenneman's right. uh, call. So, you know, Virginia Tech and uh, uh, Clemson. Should, it was Virginia Tech-Clemson Clemson. this week, I think. Probably should oh, yeah, have been on the CW. It was. It wasn't, though. So, 
tonight, college football playoff rankings. We'll see how far Georgia will fall. We will see how far Miami will fall, speaking of the ACC. Um, but, Chad, the, the losses and how many wins teams are, are piling up seems to be the only criteria right now that, uh, in terms of the debate that I'm hearing. There's no really digging or there's no layers to this discussion as much as there should be, at least surface level amongst the media and fans. Yeah, so the charge of the selection committee is to give the best 11 teams in the country, mm-hmm. right? You're going to have four that have to represent each of the big power four conferences. Right. And then one group of four team or group of five. That, that would be Boise State now as the 12th. It's not to give you mathematically who has the fewest amount of losses. Now, losses matter. That, that is part of the equation, no doubt. Your overall record, who you lost to, how many losses you have, that clearly is something that factors in. I'm just going to go, I'm not going to give you the teams. I'm just going to give you the math okay. right now, okay? Straight down the list. One through, let's say, 13. 9-0, and 7-1, oh, 7-1, 9-0, 7-1, 7-1, 7-1, 9-0, 8-0, 7-1, 6-2, 7-1, 8-1. And then you get to more two-loss teams at that point on down. Now, when you go ranking spots 12 through 25, there's some variation of losses. There is a one-loss team sandwiched in between a two- and three-loss team, as an example. Now, all this changed this past weekend, but that's the latest ranking. Here's what I don't want to see when we get to the final selection, because people want to argue, well, these rankings don't matter because it's not the end of the year. Yeah, we all get that. This isn't going to be the the playoff, but when Army and Boise State are separated by that much, hell yeah, it matters. Yeah. A lot of these do matter how far apart you are right now. So we're getting our first sense of what the committee is looking for. I just don't want a scenario where it just boils down to well, Penn State and Indiana have one loss, and these three SEC teams have two losses. So definitely Penn State and Indiana are ahead of the two-loss SEC teams. And for that matter, I present to you the case of Georgia. If Georgia loses on Saturday, Georgia will have lost to three top 10 teams, two of them on the road, one of them at home. They also will have wins over top 10 teams throughout the year, two of them. So how do you gauge a Georgia versus a two-loss team, let's say, if they have three losses? Penn State versus Tennessee or Notre Dame versus a Tennessee. What's Notre Dame's big win? At Texas A&M, first game of the year. I don't know that they're going to have a gigantic win outside of that when you look at teams around the top 10 or top 15. Penn State, what was their big opportunity? At home against Ohio State. They lost. And then they're going to beat everyone else that they should beat on their schedule and get to 11-1. Well, does that make them better than a two-loss Tennessee team that has a win over top 10 Alabama, who now almost definitely looks like they're going to work their way into the playoff field? I don't know. I can make an argument on either side of this. I really could. There's an argument to be made for all of these teams. I just beg of the playoff committee to not just – go the easy route and slot these teams based on number of losses. Really look into who did they beat, who was their loss. Notre Dame has the worst loss of any of these teams by not just a mile, by a thousand miles when they lost at home to Northern Illinois. So how do you rate that versus a bunch more games that, that don't look that great? Miami, their wins right now, not good. They don't have a signature marquee gigantic win on their resume. They got some close calls against some not so good teams that they played throughout the year. So just don't take the easy way out. That that's all I'm asking of the committee. Make sure you're dissecting this and looking at it a little bit closer than just basing it off the math of who has the fewest losses. So they the way they do this is odd to me. How they rank their 25. They don't just show up and turn in their top 25 teams. They rank them three teams at a time in these little groups of three. That's interesting. So pods. They, they have these pods. And it's based on... So, it, so you turn in your, let's say, your top 10, right? When they get there. They then come up with the consensus group 
of like five, and then they debate those teams to come up with their three, then they rank those three. They have in front of them all of these analytics, and the one thing that, uh, that they pay attention to, and we know this because they had like this trial or this mock committee for media last year where they were able, they were flown in and they had this whole thing laid out based on last year's uh, college football playoff debate. You have your schedules laid out and there's like, for like quality win, quality, not quality wins, just quality of opponent at the time you play them. And there's like a green square, like, like, like almost like neon green. And then it like dark red at the bottom. That's, that's like the gauge that's your that good or bad. And then like middle of the road, there's almost like a very blank spot there. So you, if you have a team that has a lot of green next to them on their schedule, they're going to debate whether or not that's more valuable than a team that may have one or two more like fading red squares. The again, maroon, like, again it sounds squares. bizarre, but that's what they're doing in the room. And, you know, the, the committee is, is made up of a lot of different sections of the country, but there's no way that you can look at what Ohio State has done or Oregon and then compare it to what we've seen from Georgia or Bama with what Chad just laid out with their top 10 opponents schedule at the time. But also, I, I don't want to knock Notre Dame because at the time, Navy was ranked in the, what, top 17 when they played them. Now, some of the teams that Georgia would face at the time may not be ranked so great right now. Ole Miss is going to be much better after their win, for instance. Uh, Oregon is credited with that one-point win over Ohio State, which, again, they value that. Chad, my point is, I think week to week, they can change their criteria however they want. And we could get to a point where Boise ultimately could be ranked higher than one of the Power Four uh, programs that gets a, a title game, a uh, one of their conference title games. They could get a bye. And so that, then how do you slot the rest of the teams based on that, knowing that, you know, I will use BYU for the example, or heck, let's use SMU. Um, unbeaten right now in the driver's seat for the ACC. But if they lose, how far are they going to fall? Because SMU wasn't even the top 12 last week. So keeping that in mind, Chad, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, so does a two-loss SEC team get in over an at-large ACC team if Boise's ranked ahead of them? Because that's how they're going to slot them. I, I doubt it because here's my point. The final rankings, ESPN's going to have a heavy hand in that. They did last year. They're going to say they don't. They absolutely will. Well, that's why I'm amazed by the amount of people that, that we have on this show even that are just like, oh, if you're in the SEC championship, you've surely locked up a I, playoff I don't spot, buy right? It. I don't buy it. And I'm like, I, I broke it down yesterday. Here is the ESPN playoff calculator. And I gave just the scenario with Tennessee. They are better off avoiding the SEC championship because if they lose, their percentage chance goes from 75 to 26% right. of making the playoff just by losing in the SEC championship. Georgia schedule, they will have beaten Clemson bad, who was 14th at the time, currently 23rd in the college football playoff uh, schedule. Their two losses are at number four, Alabama at the time. Right. And at number 16, Ole Miss, they're going to climb also yep. at the time. They would also own a win at number one, Texas at the time, and at home against number seven and whatever they're going to be ranked now, which would be a little bit higher, Tennessee. Th that's pretty good. Alabama, no, it's really, I think it's really good I based think, on the opponents. I think Penn State, Notre Dame, someone else of the one-loss teams, they each have one top 25 win so far on the season. Alabama's got four with two losses. Uh, I don't even know if Penn State does right now. Alabama beat Georgia, Missouri, LSU. Oh, Penn State does. They, they beat Illinois. I don't know if Illinois is still in the top 25. I know they're not in the playoff well, at ranking. the time they were, though. At the time, yes, they, they were. That's so, their one. I mean, I think you have to weigh also at the time versus, right? You're going to look at it now, but too, I, by the end of the year. But the, see, I, at the, I think they're going to just be heavy-handed on what has happened recently based on the team. Because, again, 
Well, if they Florida's, go by what happened at the time, then Tennessee suddenly has two more top 25 wins or, over NC State and Oklahoma. And, and Florida State would be in the playoff last year. Right. If they go by what happened at the time. But we know they lost their quarterback. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think they, it, they absolutely will factor in losses in the SEC or Big Ten championship game. They will. Because they'll figure out a way to maneuver. You know my, you know my saying and what I believe. It's not if you lose, it's how you lose. And, and again, Ohio State lost to Oregon, but they benefit from the way they played and how they lost. More so than what we saw from Georgia against Ole Miss, because Ohio State loses, they don't fall that far. I know the committee rankings didn't come out at the time. They won't fall that far. But Georgia, I mean, we could see them at the very bottom tonight or, or out of the college football playoff. Now, again... They still control their way in based on a, a must win coming up against Tennessee. But you understand what I'm saying. Like they, they will fall further based on how they lost. Well, things tend to work out for the SEC, but the best case scenario for the conference right now is that one of these one loss teams, Texas or Tennessee, they continue on with one loss to the end of the year, get to the SEC championship and lose to a two loss team. And then that guarantees the loser of the SEC championship is not knocked out. So then the one loss team gets to two, but they're still in, having played well, that the extra game. will absolutely get in. Yeah. Because, yes. Yeah. But my point is, if a two-loss SEC team gets to the championship game and loses, there's a good likelihood they're out of I the playoff. So. And that is going to piss that team and that fan base off. And it's going to bring up these questions about, should you avoid the SEC championship game? Well, I mean, right now there's seven. Is it seven, better mathematically to do that? There are seven teams in the SEC with – two losses right now with one or two one or two yeah so if you're I mean right now Ole Miss wouldn't be in the SEC title game I don't believe but they're going to be in the playoff if things yeah, just I'm, go chalk I'm because just the, they the, won't have to play that extra game the best case is a two loss team beats a one loss team in the SEC championship securing right. oh, that no two doubt. losses team spot that's the automatic no doubt they get the top four by but then that doesn't blast the one loss team completely no. out of the playoff because the one- they're still going to be comfortably in with only two losses. Yes. The doomsday scenario is that two loss team that has a great resume is going to roll into Atlanta, get beat, and find themselves in the Rely Quest Bowl down in Tampa because of it. And that's going to be a doomsday scenario for that program. And we're not going to talk about the other balls. Things You're right. tend to work out well for the SEC in the end. So I could I could very well see a Texas rolling in with one loss and losing the mm-hmm. SEC championship game and making sure someone else gets in while Texas isn't out. They just take a knee? <laughs> yeah. They take the fall? They're, they're going to take the fall like Tom Brenneman took the fall. Oh, man. No, yeah. Right on the sword.